hey, making good people defenseless does not make bad people harmless. Think about it. Gun control laws only disarm the law-abiding. Murder, rape, and assault are already against the law. Do you really think a law that bans concealed carry stops a criminal? Help us fight back and become a member of San Diego County Gun Owners. We make activism easy, so join today. Go to sdcgo.org slash join and sign up today to be a member. Together we will win. Together we you will need to win. Get tape. Get tape for okay. your shoulder. For my shoulder. It's athletics tape. You ever see them on these sports guys? They got tape all over them. Hey, yeah. Hey, tape. It works. I uh, what about magic. that? What about that pink tape that women used to put you in their hair have when they had pink, a? You can have <laughs> if you want. Well, pink. I don't know about my shoulder. It's my bicep there. Okay, hurts. but you put this. You never listen to me when I tell you I don't, what to do. I don't listen to you. Well, I noticed that. What, so I should put tape on my shoulder? Yes, it's it's the sport tape. If you put it where it hurts, it'll go away. All right, I'll do that. I mean, I didn't even win the other night. They didn't win what? What are you talking at about? Gun, at the, the Christmas party. The ugly oh. sweater. Project. I thought I had the best. I Look, thought your sweater was beautiful. Nobody else had a gun sweater. <laughs> my, I thought your, your wife's sweater was the she best. She flipped you off. <laughs> wow. And but she didn't win not either. Not the first. <laughs> Chief, we didn't win either. Did you guys have fun at the Christmas party? We did. Yeah, we that did. was actually a hoot. We have Alicia and Desi in the studio with yeah. me and Dave. It's yeah. Girls Against Boys today. That's right. And the best part of the whole movie, or the whole show, was <laughs> yeah. the movie you had running. That's right. We had uh, the very best Christmas movie ever made. Ever. I watched the whole thing. Die Hard. Yep. Great movie. <laughs> it really it. is a good movie. I really it helps you get into the Christmas spirit, I think. That's what I thought. <laughs> anyway, okay, had so had a good drink. Great, yeah, we did. Away. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It was an awesome Christmas party, and then the uh, women's Christmas party was was last night, right? How'd you guys do? It was good. We had a good group of ladies. You know, we had some good food, great conversation. These so, yeah. are the Not Me SD ambassadors, correct? And you guys had a ham, I think. We did. That was our main dish. Yeah. We had some good. He showed food. up. No, no, I don't get no. invited. Alicia to. was there. No, but the should, ham, she showed up. Ah, get it. Ah. <laughs> Um, save the date, by the way. Got to get some information out before uh, before it's too late here. March 2nd and 3rd is the next San Diego gun show. You heard it here first. March 2nd and 3rd, the next San Diego gun show at a new venue at the Legacy Center in Mission Valley. The Legacy Center yep. in Mission Valley. Huge. And you're going to have hot rods. We're going to have hot rods. We're going to have ammo. We're going to have guns. We're at, And then we're showing a movie Saturday night. At the Red Dawn. No, 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 you can't say that on, on air. You seriously can't say it on air. You can't tell what it is. Yeah. We'll talk about it off air. We're showing a movie oh, darn. that sounds very much like a movie that I re really, really love. <laughs> Isn't it weird? Part of the contract was we you can't say the name of the movie on radio or TV. Serious. We can put it in the email. We can put it up on our website. Really? But they said we can't advertise it because they don't want to compete with movie theaters, mm. and that movie has uh, been out for 40 years. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's in any theaters. But can we add that to the box office numbers to uh, Wikipedia? <laughs> oh, yeah. We're going to add huge to the box office numbers. It's going to be very cool, but uh, just write down March 2nd, March 3rd. Take that whole weekend and block it out. Tell the significant other. Saturday that, hey, and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday. Saturday night, we're going to have a nice big party and show a movie. Uh, Saturday is the symposium and the gun show in the same place at a uh, a very very nice new uh, venue. It's What's be Sunday? Very, very cool. Sunday is going to be the rest of the gun show. Oh, and then I think uh, Gun Owners Radio. We're probably going to be there. We haven't really talked about it yet, oh. but I think we're going to be there. All Dave. right, we'll figure it out. That'll be March third. Okay. In fact, let's just talk about it right now. We're going to be there. Gun Owners Radio is yeah. going <laughs> to broadcast from Absolutely. the gun show. Absolutely, right. that'll work, right? I think it will. It is Christmas coming up. And if you need to give a gift, give the gift of training. Have you considered giving training to your loved ones? CCW USA Stronghold Dynamic San Diego Firearms School. Mike Mike Pettengill from Personal Protection Academy and Paragraph Two. Mike Pettengill and and Jim from Paragraph Two were both guests in the studio last week. They're all offering to uh, give gift certificates. So if you want to give the gift of training for Christmas. Go to CCW USA or Stronghold Dynamic or San Diego Firearms School or Personal Protection Academy in Paragraph 2. Those two are in Riverside County, but uh, close enough for anybody in San Diego to participate in. So definitely, definitely, definitely check them out. So this is a cool show. We have Masada Yub coming up. We're going to talk to a guy running for Congress. We're going to talk about Not Me, and then we're going to talk about a press release that Not Me California, which is the 501c3, put out. 
and uh, it's going to be a very, very exciting show. So, you know what? It, by the way, you know what? It, some, somebody annoyed the heck out of me right before the show, Dave. I am so sorry. I'll go. <laughs> sorry, not, not Mike. You, not you either. <laughs> not you. Know, it's a whole other different list of people that annoyed me. Well, somebody. I, it it annoys me to no end when people say that they listen to the universe. You know, they're like, oh, I was doing this and I was doing that and that happened to me. And the universe told me not to do X, Y, or Z anymore. What station you ever heard that? It wasn't a station. It was a person I was actually having a conversation with. Have you ever heard that? You know, like you got to listen to the universe. The universe was telling me not to do X, Y, Z today. Really? So I did. No one's ever heard that? Yeah. I don't know. You've heard it. Alicia's heard it. Have you heard it? Oh, yeah. It is the most arrogant thing heard I've ever heard. I Somebody, never heard it. the universe isn't talking to anybody. Not talking <laughs> like to for me. you to I think, speak to you. <laughs> for <laughs> someone to think that the universe, the entire universe, did something, and to tell them not to go get a mani pedi that day or to stay at home and watch TV or something like that, the most arrogant thing in the world. Well, sometimes anyway, you get rather black. And I did it put a burr in my saddle. I don't even ride horses. So. Thank God. Anyway, but it's going to be a good conversation. It's going to be a good show. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to Masada Yub. He is absolutely one of the the premier experts when it comes to the Second Amendment and firearms. Um, I, I mean, really, truly, uh, should be on the Mount Rushmore of Second Amendment folks. And we're going to talk to him about an ongoing subject that we've been talking about kind of casually here and there. But I think it's a good ongoing discussion to have. Um, and get some various perspectives. And that's, uh, you know, what's the relationship between 2A activists, Second Amendment activists, and law enforcement? Can you be pro-Second Amendment, a pro-Second Amendment activist, and back the blue? You know, can you be, uh, how, how are you, how can you be a firearms, or I'm sorry, how can you be a law enforcement and be an effective Second Amendment advocate? It's it's an interesting dynamic, and there, there's the reason it's interesting is there's so much overlap between the two groups, um, but there's also some pretty amazing. Uh, uh, what's the word? There's controversy. Controversy, uh, friction between the two. You know, so how do you do it? What do we do? What's the balance? You know, how do we work this? I think it's a it's a good subject, and I I, I like the fact that we're having a discussion about it rather than it being a lecture or we're just releasing a stance or making demands. Um, I think it's an important discussion to have. And I don't think we have enough discussions these days. You draw a line in the sand and you're either on the red side or the blue side and, and that's it. Like that's all, those are the only choices you have. And I think that that's, I think it's as dangerous to, you know, uh, politics and, and uh, you know, um, as and and just society in general is, is it's just it's just ridiculous. I think it's absolutely childish. So I'm looking forward to it. Masada Ayub's been law enforcement and he's pro Second Amendment. So oh, yeah, that'll be an interesting. Uh, and I'm totally geeking out over here. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, he's been on the show a couple times. He's yeah. a great guy. At least once or twice. I've heard of him. So, so what do you think, Desi? Looking forward to the show. It'll be a good show today. Yeah. And in the five o'clock hour, we're going to talk to you about not me. Yes, sir. Um, and we're going to talk. You can about dive in early if you like. Yeah, of course. Got plenty to talk about today. Yeah, I think so. Big waters. One of the things we're gonna—I know we got this. You, you know what? You renew the contract. Yeah, and I got big water. <laughs> you got big water, and I got AC. Yeah. So there you go. Supply and demand. The other thing we're gonna talk about is SB two has yet another um, piece of evil that it has injected into the California gun community. So we're gonna go over that probably in the five o'clock hour. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's uh, you have an update. It's pretty ugly. Have an update. Mm-hmm. It's um, ugly. It's ugly, but we're not. You know, like everything else, we're not even. In, we're not even in the fight yet. You know what I mean? Like it's just. It's it's going to be fine. Still in the locker. Room. I know we're going to be fine. So we'll let everybody know what's going on. Hey, gun owners, listen up! If you ever have legal matters that involve a firearm, you need California's best firearm lawyer, and that means John Dillon. He can help you with red flag laws, gun registration. Gun transportation, or maybe you just need to know that your guns are California compliant. John Dillon specializes in California gun laws, so put his name on your phone right now. 760-642-7150. That's John Dillon, California firearms lawyer, 760-642-7150. Our next guest is a Second Amendment superstar, and I, I I could spend the rest of the show just reading his resume. He's done a ton when it comes to Second Amendment advocacy. Uh, there's just simply no one, uh, no one bigger and better than him, no one more knowledgeable. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Masad Ayub to the show. How are you, Masad? Hey, 
Uh, not bad for a, an elderly cripple. Uh, <laughs> good to be on the show again. Good. Well, thank you so much for, for spending time with us. So the topic of the show, I, I was talking a little bit in the last segment, it's it's an ongoing discussion. Um, it's not an argument. It's not a decree. It's not a, you know, uh, a screaming match or a lecture. Um, it's a discussion. I think it's one worthy of having, um, especially in this day and age. Uh, you know, law enforcement takes an oath to protect the Constitution, and clearly there are laws, especially in California, that infringe upon the Second Amendment, which, of course, is part of the Constitution. And basically, you know, the gist is if someone gets arrested for an unconstitutional law, if someone gets arrested for a, uh, a gun law that we all want to go away because it is unconstitutional, but it's working its way through the courts or whatever, it's going to be law enforcement that does the arrest. And there's a lot of overlap between Second Amendment advocates and law enforcement. And uh, not all Second Amendment advocates are pro-law enforcement, and not all law enforcement are pro-Second Amendment. Um, and, and the question is, you know, how do we reconcile all that? You know, how, can you be a Second Amendment advocate and be pro-law enforcement? Can you be law enforcement and be an effective Second Amendment advocate? And I really wanted to uh, kick it off there and get your, get your take on that. Well, speaking from personal experience, yes, I carried a badge for 43 years. I was an armed citizen uh, before they pinned the badge on me, and I've been an armed citizen uh, since I retired from law enforcement. And I found the majority of actual working cops are very much in favor of uh, private citizens, just like virtually every working paramedic uh, wants the general public to know CPR and uh, general first aid, just like Every firefighter wants every home to be equipped with uh, smoke alarms and fire extinguishers. The defensive firearm is a direct analog to the, the home fire extinguisher or the automatic electronic defibrillators that many of us keep in our homes. It's an emergency life-saving rescue tool that allows the, the individual to hold the line against death until the trained professionals for the heavy equipment can get there to take over. Uh, nationwide, we have, uh, in a nation of some 330 million people, we have no more than 800,000 cops, and their numbers are diminishing daily. Uh, re re response time is going to vary wildly depending on the population density, the time of day, the traffic patterns, the weather. Um, uh, the, the most common figure I hear for average response time is 11 minutes. Well, uh, you can't uh, talk gently to the armed intruder for 11 minutes and expect to have a good outcome. You need something a little more substantial than that. If you wait 11 minutes to fight the fire, the house is burned down to the foundation by the time the firefighters get there. Uh, in a world where the medics tell us uh, if the heart is stopped beating for five minutes, a reversible brain death is setting in. If there's nobody there that knows how to do CPR, 11 minutes later, the paramedics will find an unviable patient and the frustration of being unable to save someone they existed to save. And the cops are the same way. They, they can't uh, dance in the streets when one of you guys kills a bad guy in self-defense. But behind, behind closed doors, they're giving each other high fives. This is the good guy won. So by and large... Um, it's been my experience that in the field, the, the people with the boots on the ground doing the job, uh, they absolutely support Second Amendment and responsible use of defensive firearms by law-abiding armed citizens. It's such a nuts and bolts way of, exp of, of, of laying it out. That was, what an excellent picture you, you just painted of uh, you know comparing it to other uh, emergency tools to help, that are, that are life-saving. I, I think that's uh, I think we we could all learn to. Uh, uh, describe it much, much better and in that way. I think that's excellently done. Um, do you think that uh, – I, I think it might be different in California. The more I, I – you know, we've had a couple of these discussions. And do you think that the the uh, friction between Second Amendment uh, advocates and uh, law enforcement might be a, a uniquely California thing? Um, you know, and, and I'll tell you, I, I remember when I was going through my, through a, a class long ago, actually, before I, I even got my CCW, this is, I think I was, I think I was getting my Utah CCW about 10 years ago. And, and, uh, they pointed out, the instructor pointed out that in Utah, 
Um, if you have a CCW, a lot of people, you know, show it to if they get pulled over or whatever from law enforcement, they say, "Hey, I'm, you know, here's my license, my driver's license, and my CCW," because it makes law enforcement more comfortable. You know, oh, okay, great, this person's passed a background check, they've got fingerprints on file somewhere. You know, we're in California. There were so many stories, especially you know before. Uh, the breakthrough uh, maybe five, six, seven years ago when CCW started becoming more common in, C- in, in California, you'd hear about you know CHP folks who would uh, pull somebody out of their car and cuff them and put them on the sidewalk because they found out they were a CCW holder. And it, 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 do you think so? So that's a big long setup for the question. Do you think that this uh, friction might be a, a, a uniquely California or a uniquely you know bad gun law state thing? Well, certainly a uniquely bad gun law state thing. You'd never hear of that happening in Arizona, for example, New Hampshire or Florida. Uh, I think what you have there, again, is the the institutional culture. Hmm. Uh, Remember, uh, California has always been a May issue state. And the history of that nationwide, and certainly in California, has generally been, we'll give you the permit if you're white, male, rich, and politically connected. Yeah. And I, I can remember, uh, as a young cop visiting the LAPD Academy, hearing young ki- young officers being told, look, the, in the old days, in the old West, everybody out here carried a gun. It ain't the old West anymore. There's only two kinds of people carrying guns anymore, us and the bad guys. Uh, Rich, who was kind of left out of the equation there? Yeah. CCW uh, holder is a good guy with a gun. You know, a normal, everyday, average 90 whatever nine percent of gun owners was left out now you guys have come a long way over the years and i, I hope your young gun gun rights uh, advocates realize that uh today i see much of california as you know northern and southern california is almost like east and west berlin um, <laughs> nor, nor northern california is damn near may issue or shell issue for the most part uh, Southern California, as you well know, has historically been uh, uh, very, very elitist in the the issuing of the permits. Yeah, uh, was uh, was someone dear in the know, past. Someone, <laughs> someone dear to me uh, moved to San Francisco and said, "Okay, how do I get my permit out here?" And I said, "You get elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors." <laughs> It really is, and it's it is um, it's a uh, you know a couple things about that too. There really is a it's not so much a difference between like blue and red, you know. Um, it's really more a difference between rural and 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 urban, um, because if you look outside of the the rural, I'm sorry, the urban areas in, in California, we're just like regular Americans, you know the the suburban and especially the the, the rural areas of California are very, you know, very normal people. It's it's the downtown San Diego, unfortunately. It's all of L.A. It's all of San Francisco, and then San Francisco kind of spills out into the rest of the Bay Area. I think there's like seven or eight counties that surround San Francisco, and if you take those out of the equation, we're just like every other state, um, which is unfortunate. That you know, uh, just over fifty percent of the of the uh, of the state is is uh, enforcing their bias and and uh, you know tyranny on the rest of the state, which is really truly unfortunate. It is. Um, one of the things you'll find is when you hear police speaking out against gun owners, what you always hear it's almost always municipal police mm-hmm. chiefs. And what you've got to understand the in virtually every city, the chief of police is an appointed official, not an elected official. Uh, if he does not dance on the puppet strings of the, the mayor and the city council, he's not going to get that nice job with a high salary and the mahogany desk and the, the white uniform shirt that signifies he doesn't have to go out and get dirty anymore with all the gold stuff on it. Uh, you'll find generally in most of the country, and this does not seem to be true, unfortunately, in the uh, more urban counties of, of California, the elected sheriffs tend to be very pro-gun because they know they are that they don't serve at the will of the, the mayor; they serve at the will of the people. And and study after study, and ev- there's evidence after evidence that shows that 
people want to be able to defend themselves. People, by and large, in this country, in most states, are, are pro-Second Amendment. There are two questions I, I want to talk about. I want, I want to get your perspective on when we, uh, on the other side of the, the commercial. Um, and it's from both sides because you've been on both sides. I, I think you're just about the perfect person to have this discussion and be a part of this discussion. My, my two questions are going to be, when, uh, what advice do you have um, and what are your thoughts on uh, police officers who have to enforce laws they disagree with? You know, what's your advice? What do they do? What should their mindset be? What's the best and worst case scenario? And then the other one is the other perspective. If you're an advocate, you're a Second Amendment advocate, you're, you know, you're dedicating a big part of your life to making sure that people have the right to keep and bear arms. How do you look at, 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 at law enforcement? You know, local, state, federal, how do you look at law enforcement? What should your perspective be? And, and maybe even a touch of, you know, what's, uh, what do you, what's your recourse? If, 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 you know, if, if, uh, if there is a law enforcement that's being overzealous or, um, you know, or you just want to have an impact on, on their opinion, you know, what do we do? How do we reach out to law enforcement? How do we get them to, to maybe come closer to our opinion or, or, you know, what action should we ask them to take? So from both sides, what's going to be your advice for law enforcement on 2A? What's going to be your advice for 2A advocates on law enforcement when we get back? Hey, Riverside, San Bernardino. Even with the Bruin case, the gun grabbers are getting even more desperate. Let's face it, all these laws disarm only the people that would use a gun to defend themselves. Fight back and do something to defend your Second Amendment right? Join Inland Empire gun owners right now. We're growing the 2A community and are getting more pro 2A officials elected. Membership is only $10 a month. And joining is real easy. Just go to iegunowners.com slash join. Okay, we're talking to Masada Ayub, who is a Second Amendment superstar. And before we went to the break, I asked the question, two questions. Um, one is, what, what advice do you have for law enforcement when it comes to Second Amendment? In other words, if they have to enforce laws that they disagree with, um, you know, what's your advice? And then uh, after that, we're going to get advice for Second Amendment advocates and, as to how, how to interact with law enforcement, what should be the mindset with law enforcement, not just, uh, you know, in, in a, an actual, uh, you know, physical interaction, but as an advocate from their, uh, you know, when they're doing advocacy, um, how should they, uh, what should the mindset and perspective be when it comes to law enforcement? Let's start with law enforcement. What advice do you have for 2A fans that are law enforcement career? Well, given the uh, the the media fueled hatred of police today, is probably the worst time in my lifetime to become a cop. So uh, I salute the courage of those who want to. Um, we've got to look at uh, you know laws we disagree with versus laws that are blatantly constitutional. The latter, the cops will largely take care of themselves. Uh, <clears throat> A decade ago, when they passed the uh, magazine ban and all that in Colorado, most people don't realize uh, among the plaintiffs when uh, when we uh, when we sued the governor over that, uh, among the plaintiffs were the vast majority of the fifty-some high sheriffs of the state of Colorado, and they all said flatly, "If this continues, we will instruct our people not to enforce this law." Uh, we saw most recently September of 2023 uh, in Albuquerque. Remember the mayor who said, uh, "We I, I now automatically suspend concealed carry privileges here, here, and here." Uh, the sheriff, the chief, who was a Democrat, the chief of police, who was a Democrat, and the attorney general, who was a Democrat, all said, "Wait a minute, this is unconstitutional." This will not be enforced. And they literally uh, made a mockery of the anti-gun mayor who had overstepped there. Uh, so don't go on the assumption that uh, cops want to uh, enforce unconstitutional laws. Uh, if you don't like the way a red flag law works, unfortunately, if they serve one on you, it does have, uh, at least for now, the power of law. Uh, so basically comply. Hopefully, you will win a substantial lawsuit afterwards if it was found that it was done unconstitutionally. 
But the fact is, sadly, uh, the courts have held that laws don't have to be unconstitutional because they're stupid. Uh, they have to have been done uh, you know, in accordance with this, that, and the other principle. Now, under Bruin, uh, I believe we're going to see a great many uh, anti-gun laws overturned. But as you're seeing, it takes an enormous amount of time. A lot of time. Uh, it also takes an enormous amount of expense on our side. Yeah. Uh, I'm currently president of the Second Amendment Foundation. Over the years, we've had at any given time about 30 lawsuits going. Uh, today, we have over 50. Yeah. And virtually all of the increase has been the uh, the knee-jerk reaction of people like Governor Hockel in uh, New York, who uh, blatantly said, we're going to violate the ruling of the United States Supreme Court and essentially invalidate concealed carry permits with our sensitive space rules by making everything a sensitive space where you can't carry. So I, I do not think those are going to stand up but we have to wait for them to go through the due process through the Supreme Court. Yeah, and there's a there there's a uh, court date on Wednesday out here in California that's going to talk about the that the, they're it's all it's all about the sensitive places uh, uh, part of SB two which passed in California. Let me give you okay. So this is as a, a you know this is a hard scenario and public policy based on you know uh, hard scenarios or outliers is, is not you know it's bad so. Yeah, this is an exception. This is an extreme case, but I still think it's worth talking about. Years ago, there was a, a real case here in California. A guy's house was burning down, and firefighters were trying to put the 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 uh, uh, fire out. And you know, cops showed up, and he and you know the homeowner and the cops st started pulling things out of the out of the house. You know, just trying to salvage as many things as they could so they didn't get affected by by fire. So you know, pictures off the wall, that sort of thing. And his guns. And they pulled out a number of guns, put them on the front lawn, and one of the police officers said, wait a minute, this doesn't comply with the, at the time, relatively new assault weapons ban. And as this guy's house was burning down, he they put him in cuffs and hauled him away for, uh, for violating the assault weapon uh, charge. Now, that's an extreme scenario. That's not happening in every city and every fire and every gun owner. That's an extreme scenario. Um, so maybe it's not fair to even ask that question, but you know, in that scenario, what, what, what should the cops have done or what would your advice be to the cops? And then what's, what do you tell the second amendment advocates about law enforcement, you know, in that scenario? What, you know, you know what I mean? What's the advice for something that difficult and horrible? Well, uh, my advice to the second amendment advocates is fight it in the courts, not on the side of the road. Nobody wins a fight with the cops on the side of the road. Uh, if you feel you've uh, been wrongfully arrested or the property has been wrongfully confiscated, fight it in court. You'll make a, hire an attorney, make a complaint to the law enforcement agency, and bring it to court. And you can generally expect a substantial out-of-court settlement if, in fact, you have been wronged. Now, the curse of this is we are basically stuck with obeying the law. Uh, I don't like the 10-round magazine limit any more than you do, but when I'm in California, there will not be a magazine on my person or in my luggage that will hold more than 10 rounds. Uh, do not knowingly violate the law. Balance. Ask yourself, what is the likelihood of needing more than uh, a 10-round magazine uh, sooner than I can reload? versus uh, being in a situation like you're describing, where you're in an auto accident, uh, you know, the spare, you know, 33-round Glock magazine in the glove box is discovered. If you know the thing is against the law, basically either you've got a choice. Arizona accepts refugees. Florida <laughs> accepts refugees. It's easy for me to say that, but... For most people, you have so many family ties and job ties, a uh, move out of state is difficult. At the same time, what I've always told people is, look, if, if skiing is an important part of your life, you're going to find a way to live near the snow. If, if surfing is a big part of your life, you're going to live near a coastal beach. And if being armed and free is an important part of your life, particularly now and more than ever since the pandemic, it's possible to work uh, remotely from home. 
why allow yourself to be made a felon when you could move to another city and another state where the laws are more compatible with your personal values? Now, one thing that does bother me, and I think it's hurting the Second Amendment uh, more than it helps it, is the so-called uh, Second Amendment audit, where we see people sometimes actually genuinely believing that you know it will make a positive difference, walking around with an AR-15 on a tactical sling just past the, the school zone, or walking in a Chipotle's with you know an AK-47 and the hands in almost a ready-to-shoot position on the gun. Uh, it may be technically legal, but don't tell me uh, that it's you know that, that it's going to improve Second Amendment relations and normalize guns in American society. All you're doing is scaring the hell out of people. You don't know how many of the people who see you with that gun have had some incident in their life when they were terrorized by an armed criminal or a loved one committed suicide or did something terrible with a firearm. And it, you, you're, like, so, you're, you're like a smoker going into a non-smoking environment and blowing smoke in someone's face. So my advice is, please, do, do not do that. Our, our Second Amendment advocate colleague, uh, Tamara Keel, said it best. She said, don't carry guns at people. Mm. If well, if you want to express Second Amendment advocacy, show up in a suit and a tie at the at the hearings at the state house. There you go. That that's speak calmly. Give them facts. The facts are on our side. The history of this, honest to God, wretch, has been the other side uses emotion. The logic, the facts, the statistics are on our side. That's the thing that annoys me most about the 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 demonstrators. You know, the people that you just described that you know that carry guns at people and they're trying to make a scene. You know, when I need people to go to a city council, you know, and, and fight against something that's happened at the city council level, nowhere to be seen. When I need people to be ad or, uh, plaintiffs in a lawsuit, nowhere to be seen. When I need, uh, you know, to raise money to help get good people elected, nowhere to be seen. So these same people that want to go make a big spectacle out of themselves, you know, okay, great. You know, yeah, it probably is unconstitutional or, you know, whatever law that, that you're, uh, uh, you know, going against. Or maybe you are doing something that's totally, completely legal. But when it comes to doing something effective and meaningful and, oh, by the way, constitutional, you know, you're nowhere to be seen. And that, that part really, really annoys me. But, um, Masai, before we go, um, Alicia here has a, uh, a question for you that she, she, sure. she'd been dying to ask. <laughs> hey, Masai, how, hey, how are you? I'm old. How are you? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I'm feeling that way myself. So I'm curious. I know that you spend a lot of time um, instructing and teaching others, and and I'm curious. I know that you worked a lot with the law enforcement community and, and a lot with the public at large um, and, and teaching firearm safety, and I'm just curious what, out of all the people that you've worked with and all the different dynamics that you've taught and, and worked with, what would be the your, your favorite thing to teach do you do you enjoy working more with the new people that are learning do you do you enjoy you know teaching the tactical um, element to law enforcement like what what uh, what is your well, favorite thing and you know if you could pick anything to do for the rest of your life what would it be it's it's kind of like asking me which is my favorite child <laughs> uh, each each have their own attributes mm -hmm. uh when i train instructors it's satisfying to know that you know after i've done that week with them uh, the surveys we do with how many people they teach a year indicate that by the end of the year, our training will have gone to several thousand people that they teach. Uh, when I teach the cops, I know that, look, they're, they're going to have the highest exposure to violence because they're society's gunfighters. They're the ones who are required to ride to the sound of the guns. When I train the private citizens, I remember back through my family, my grandfather, the first in the our family in this country, was involved in multiple armed encounters as a small businessman, and the gun saved his life. Uh, my father, uh, when he was 23 years old, long before I was born, a gun saved his life when two men tried to murder him, and he put them horizontal. Uh, one dead at the scene, one, uh, one actually died in the ambulance, and the other died a year or two later from the effects of the wound. And I would not be here if it was not for them. I've had to use a gun to defend myself, and my children would not be here if I hadn't done Of so my two adult daughters, one of them at the age of 19, drew a gun on, on two attempted rapists and caused them to flee. She had gotten her concealed carry permit at the age of 18 in New Hampshire. 
So while the other side has emotion, and let me close with that, so do we. When they go and talk about the, the blood that was shed by their innocent victims who became victims of criminals, we need to be telling more of the stories of American citizens who were alive because they had guns to fight back with. That analogy of the gun with the fire extinguisher, the emergency life-saving rescue tool for the real first responder to hold the line against death until the professionals can get there to deal with it. They called us cops and the firefighters and the paramedics, the first responders. We were the .gov first responders. The real first responder is the citizen there when the life-threatening danger breaks out. We must allow them to be prepared to cope with it. It's, Excellent. it's an ethical thing. Excellent job. Very well put. Thank you so much. Masada Yub, uh, President of the Second Amendment Foundation, thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you continue to do. And thank you for your time today. Hey, you want to learn to fly? Yeah. You want to get a pilot's license? I do. Well, San Diego is one of the best places to get your airplane pilot's license because pilots can fly almost every day. Learn to fly with San Diego Flight Training International. Gun Owners Radio listeners, check this out. You can get one hour of ground school, one hour of flight with an instructor, and they let you grab the stick. This is a $400 value, but for our listeners, you only pay $350. Give them a call at 858-569-1822. Learn to fly at STFTI. That's 858-569-1822. Okay, currently in San Diego, we have a Congress member who is a drunken trust fund baby and no one seemed to care about that and elected her anyway. Don't understand it. She has no expertise in anything that would put her in Congress. She makes uh, AOC look like Einstein and still they elected her. I don't get it. But uh, we have uh, some folks running against to kick her out of Washington, D.C. and uh, make her get a real job. Although she didn't have to get a real job. She's inheriting uh, millions and millions and millions on the uh, hard work of other people. Um, so she's not going to have to do anything productive or useful ever in her whole entire life, which now that I think about it, actually probably makes her very appropriate for Congress because they don't do any of that either. They don't really do anything appropriate or helpful or, or productive uh, in Washington, D.C. But let's see if we can change that. So we have a uh, – Do we have somebody? We have a candidate. It? We have there's, a, there's actually a few, few candidates running. We have a candidate on the line. Um, and uh, we, he's been on the show before. He's come to Gun Prom. Maybe you saw him there. Stan Kaplan, how are you? All right, Michael. Thanks for having me. How was how was it? Did I pretty much summarize your opponent up fairly well? You did a great job. Uh, you know, I've only been in politics uh, less than two years, and I got in because no one was going to run against Sarah Jacobs, who you just described. Yeah, uh, she, she's from the Qualcomm family. So here's what I did. Uh, she's a Democrat, of course. I went down to the Republican headquarters. Again, I had never been involved in politics, okay? And I'm no spring chicken, but I was disgusted with what's going on in our country and the policies coming out of D.C., of which Sarah Jacobs you know, fully endorses, okay? And so I asked the uh, geniuses down there at the local Republican Party, why aren't you putting anybody up to oppose her? And they said... Well, we can't find anybody to do it because uh, the registration differential, and it is significant. It was uh, 18%, uh, 43% Dem to 25% Republican. That's a lot to overcome. But, of course, the second variable was, and she has lots of money. Now, let me say this about money. What I found disgusting is that every time I went to a career politician or someone in the know or someone that had been in that field for long periods of time, the first question out of their mouth, how much money can you raise? Yep. That, that put a very bitter taste in my mouth because it became clear to me that it's all about the money and people like Sarah Jacobs can buy their position. She did. She and, did you know, buy her position. Yes. Yes, $7 million of her family's money. That's the way, that's not the way that the voters that I talk to in, in my district are supposed to be represented. You, you know what's even gross? I remember that this race, you know, back when she won, and they had a, and like you said, it's, it's, it was, you know, a lopsided race. There's far more Democrats in that district than Republicans. So everybody assumed, okay, it's going to be a Democrat that's going to get that position. It was, uh, before it was, it was basically Susan Davis. They redrew the districts a little bit, but it was basically Susan Davis's district. And so um, there were a couple of folks that fit in line with who the Democrats said they wanted in office. 
they wanted uh, diversity. You know, they wanted someone who wasn't privileged. They wanted someone who, you know, fit all the identity politics that they that they like. Okay, fine. I'm not criticizing that. If that's what they value, you know, is is you know your heritage and the color of your skin and and your 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 you know whether you're a ma- uh, you know whether a, you're a male or a female, whatever. Okay, fine. It, that's that's what you guys value. Fine. Um, and they had a number of people running who weren't white, who weren't male, who weren't rich. Um, but what happened was Sarah came in. She, she again, is I can't emphasize just how useless she is. Um, I mean, it really can't be overstated just how unintelligent and useless and unqualified she is. She hasn't done anything productive or useful ever in her whole life. Um, and she ran and basically, like you said, bought the race. I watched uh, people who uh, you know had show. For example, there was one lady. I'm not going to say who it was. There was one lady who had a uh, a fairly popular podcast, um, and uh, she was a black woman, and her you know very Democrat. Her politics were very Democrat, and you know everything said that she should endorse one of the other candidates. You know Georgette, who was on the San Diego City Council. She was a uh, a Latina woman. Um, and, uh, you know, worked her way up, that probably fall, fell far more in line with who uh, she claimed or what her she claimed her politics was. And f- in, instead, this podcaster got a new advertiser, Sarah mm-hmm. Jacobs, and guess who she endorsed? Sure. And, and that's somebody, so, okay, that's one person, that's one vote. No, that's a thought leader. That's somebody who had thousands of followers, you know, who said, hey, followers, this is the person that uh, that you should endorse. Now I got to tell you, money's important. You know, if you can't get your message in front of people, then you know people unfortunately don't take their responsibility of living in the country of the self governed serious enough to go do their own research. So money's important, um, but that's what I just described is a, is a, another a different example, a, a little bit more nefarious example of how you can buy an election, you know, is, is by literally purchasing influence, which is about as gross as it gets. So here we go. We have a extremely rich, privileged, uh, white, uh, you know, undereducated, uh, you know, person sitting in that seat when here you are. Talk, what, what's your resume, Stan? Why should people vote for you? Yeah, well, uh, you know, again, I, it didn't take me long to learn about politics. It's a disgusting game, uh, and quite frankly, I don't get along with most of the politicians. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't uh, I, uh, I go along with the Democrat policies. But what I want your listeners to understand is just because they have a D or an R bar that by their name uh, does not really define what they're going to do and how they're going to represent you. Because I will tell you, most of the Republicans are rhinos. And the mess that this country is in today is because of Democrats and Republicans. And I will tell you, when I talk to people on the street, hundreds and thousands of them, they're disgusted with politics also. They've lost faith in their government and trust in their representatives. And I will tell you, there's an undercurrent right now of people that want change and will vote for an independent because they know that when Democrats and Republicans go to Washington, they become the same. They look out for their self-interest, and they forget about the people that put them there. So did you drop the R by your name? Are you no longer running as a Republican? No, I am an independent. I left that party, and uh, you know, I got zero support from them. And, uh, you know, it all, I, in my impression is that the established parties, the Democrats and Republicans, want to stay in power. They do whatever they can to perpetuate their careers. And uh, it, it's really not putting uh, rogue candidates like myself in that will say what other candidates will not say. Okay. Because things have to get done. Desi's got a question for you. Yes. Hey, Stan. So- Fire away. As you know, we are pro-Second Amendment on this show. So what are your views on the Second Amendment, and do you support it? Absolutely. In fact, I'm fighting for every constitutional freedom. And it, and I will tell you, I don't care whether it's Joe Biden or Mayorkas or whatever, they are violating our constitutional laws. And, you know, that's what's the problem today. You know, my theme was going to be today, because I know you, your listeners they like to shoot for sport, they like to hunt, and they want their uh, guns for self-defense. But I wanted to take the tack today, what can we re- do to reduce 
the situations that would require one to have to defend himself and, you know, perhaps shoot or kill someone. And, you know, because nobody really wants a situation where someone's breaking into their house and they have to shoot them. That's a good so, segue for Alicia's next question. Alicia, what's your question? Yes. Hi, Stan. Hey. So a, Hi. A, a common question that we like to ask here, because, you know, we like to get to know uh, our guests a little bit. And, you know, one of the ways that we get to do that is we want to know what is your favorite gun? Oh, All right. Well, I have to tell you, I went to one of Michael's uh, shoots the other night where they had uh, instructors there, and boy, did I need help when I got to this uh, automatic pistol. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, I do have guns, and uh, I, I guess if someone is going to break in my house, you, you know, you can't beat a, a 12 gauge loaded with a double odd buck, you know, so uh, wh- whatever works. But uh, I, I want to add one comment uh, to your listeners. With the way things are going today, you better finish the job because uh, if you don't, they're going to end up suing you and you'll be in jail. All right. Help Orange County gun owners get the right people elected in Orange County, people that will stand up and protect your gun rights. How? By becoming a member today. Go to ocgunowner.com slash join. Now is the time to join the growing number of gun owners who care and want to protect our Second Amendment rights. Go to ocgunowners.com. Slash join and become a member today. I met an outstanding member of O. Well, actually, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's, I it was Inland Empire gun owners last week. A guy named Steve Sanchez. I think we've had him on the show, but he's a city council member in uh, Palm uh, Palm Desert. Mm-hmm. He's just an outstanding guy. He wants to uh, help grow IEGO, and uh, because he believes in the Second Amendment. Okay, so subscribe and win. Subscribe to our email list and win some swag. This week's winner is. William Hager. Hager? Is that how you say that? It's not Hager. Sounds Hager? good to me. Yeah. William Hager. Prizes at GunOwnersRadio.com. Email us to claim your T-shirt or hat. And congratulations. If you want to possibly win something cool, then go to GunOwnersRadio.com. Sign up for our newsletter, and you will get updates, including the updates on the upcoming gun show. This is going to be the best gun show. I, honestly, if we pull this off, and we can only pull this off if we get people to help us. But I, it looks like we're going to pull this off. This is going to be the best gun show I've ever seen in San Diego. You know why it is? Why? Because we're going to have hot rods, <laughs> and you're no, yeah. and you're going to come to KUSI prior to yep. the gun show. Yes. And I don't want to hear any complaining. There's too many people that showed up. I, believe me, we're going to be able to accommodate the entire world. It'll be mm-hmm. wonderful. But it's at the um, Legacy Center in Mission Valley. It's on March second and third, twenty twenty four. So it's just a few months away, a couple months away. Legacy Center on the so- south side of the 8 Freeway in Mission Valley. It's a huge, beautiful facility. That's gorgeous. If you've not been inside, it's, it's beautiful. It is cool. The, mm-hmm. So the main floor, you know that big eyeball they have in Las Vegas? Yeah. You know? So they have that exact same thing inside where we're going to be, but right. it's, it's like 20 feet tall, not, not oh, it's a baby eyeball. 400 feet. It's a baby eyeball. It's a little fish eyeball. It's a little fish eyeball. Um, but it's high tech. And of course, we're going to have movie night that Saturday night. Look for more information on that. Um, the symposium, awesome speakers, great prizes, and fun giveaways. Uh, movie night, of course, like I said earlier on the show, due to licensing restrictions, we're not allowed to say the movie uh, on stooges. the radio. <laughs> but if anybody knows Mike, they know what the movie yeah, is. The Three right. Stooges. That's right. If I were to give you a hint, what what hint should I give them? Uh, the Three Stooges. Uh, no. It stars Josh Peck and Crimson. Oh, wait, that's the other one. Get out of here. <laughs> I'm going to go, excuse me a second, I'm going to go wrestle Brendan to the ground. <laughs> that won't take much. <clears throat> If uh, yeah, if you've listened to the show, you can probably guess what it is. Um, which which should be a good hint. We'll well, just, you're we'll not just, even, every get, time we talk about, it, we'll just you're yell out. Get in trouble. We'll just yell out Wolverines. You're How gonna, about that? That okay. works. Anybody that knows the movie knows yeah. that. And yeah. you're going to get in trouble. Okay, so let's we got to talk about the movie though. That's true, and it's going to be fun. And we're going to have some commentary, and it'll be food, and it'll be it'll be a lot of fun. We're not just going to show the movie and get out of there. It's not like it's a you're going to bring you're going to bring the producer? art film or something. No. I'm not going to bring the producer. Or the daughter. We, we looked at, we actually looked at uh, one of the actors. We were like, hey, maybe we should get this guy, one of the actors for the movie. Yeah. And we looked at his Twitter feed. And we we're like, that guy's nope. not going to be interested in coming to a gun group. Oh, he's not a, <laughs> he's, isn't it, he's isn't not it on our side. Isn't it unique that you can use social media to vet somebody before you step on it and yeah. invite him yeah. and make a mistake? Yes. That's probably about one of the only good things about <laughs> social media. I was I was uh, uh, I was a little surprised that he was so 
left. Yeah, but I'm, aren't you glad? I am. I'm very glad, especially since this guy made a movie where the entire movie he was in blackface. Yeah. After, this was after Red Dawn. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, how is this guy? Anyway. Hey, people change, Dave. People change. They Give sure them the benefit do. of the doubt. Okay, we got to talk about SB2 real quick. Not exactly great news. Mm. SB2 had a lot of things in it. One of them was, of course, getting rid of, of anywhere you can carry a, a CCW, which stinks. So we filed a lawsuit. If you're a member of San Diego County Gun Owners, Orange County Gun Owners, you're a plaintiff in, in the lawsuit to get rid of the basically making every place outside of your home a sensitive area. The way lawsuits work is you can't just say we're filing a lawsuit against SB2. You have to spell out these are the pieces, parts mm-hmm. of SB2 mm-hmm. that were filing a lawsuit. And obviously, the biggest, baddest part was the sensitive uh, uh, sensitive areas part. But that's not the only thing in SB2. There's a lot to SB2. And that day, we're gonna we're in court in front of judges in Orange County on Wednesday, by the way. Um, another part, yeah. Another, hopefully, get the injunction. Another piece of this is uh, just came to light, and here's what's going on. They said, hey, they're centralizing uh, – um, uh, by the way, don't play the music, Brendan. I, I got to get this out. They, they're centralizing processing of, of CCWs, and specifically what they did is they said, look, if you're going to be an instructor to teach people the necessary 16 hours, not eight hours mm-hmm. now, 16 hours, you have to be licensed in this way. And uh, you used to be up to the sheriff. They, you know, sheriff said, "Hey, show us your curriculum, show us your licensing. We'll make a decision." And they had some 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 pretty easy to follow criteria. Well, now the state has taken that over and said, "Oh no, no, no! If you, you have to follow our rules." Now, I think honestly, I think the fifty eight sheriff's departments are probably, in a way, thankful because it's taken some work off their plate, centralizing it. But what this state has done is they put out a draft and said, "Look, uh, w- w- give us feedback, but this is what it's going to take." And they describe some of the curriculum and they describe what certifications they have to have. But the problem is the certifications they require are not the same as the certifications the sheriffs require. In fact, very few people have the type of certification that the state is going to require. And I I think I can only think of about three instructors out of 90 in San Diego that that have this qualification. So on January 1st, a lot of people, the risk is they're going to be out of business. They're not going to be able to teach this this course anymore. Alicia, do you want to weigh in on that real quick? Do you, did you take yeah. a look at it? Go so, ahead. So I will be ineligible to teach. Because, um, because, because you don't I have don't the standard. So right. really what the standard is, what they're putting for. Well, let me talk first about what it's had, what it had been prior. Is in order to be an el- to be eligible to submit your, your documentation, your certificates, and your curriculum to be considered – you had to have an NRA certification, basic pistol, a basic pistol instructor, plus one additional instructor cert. Right. And, and you know, then you had to also have your COE. There were some things you had to have in place. Um, they've taken that now, and what they're saying now is you cannot have NRA. Right. No NRA inst- you know, instructor certs. You have to be, uh, you have to have a couple, there's a, there's three different avenues that they've given. One is going to be uh, you, you post certified. So basically, prior law, either current or prior law enforcement. Yep. So instructor. you had to have been a law enforcement Correct. officer. Correct. And, and that's how you get this post Correct. certification. Okay. Correct. And, and you know, they're the ones that can teach the BSIS. They do kind of give an open ended or other. Actually, let me go back and get the correct wording because I know I'm going to mess it up by memory. Um, they do have a third avenue, um, and that's going to be if you have authorization from a state of California accredited school to teach a firearm training course. Which is – who has that? I'm not sure. Nobody has that. That's that's an unknown at this point what that is. I'm not sure. Or, or former military. Right. And your MOS right. was you're a firearms instructor correct. basically. Okay, Correct. so you had to be former military where you're actually teaching people how to shoot. Law enforcement. You had to be law enforcement where you were certified, po- post-certified. Instructor. Correct. Or you had a BSIS, right? Well, the, yeah, the, correct. So the, B, the BSIS uh, is, is basically the armed guard, so right. or your armed security guard. So you have the BSIS instructor, which, again, is going to kind of fall under that umbrella, which to become a BSIS instructor, prior law enforcement is a requirement. So that, that it's kind of a two and one. That's going to kind of hit both points. So, okay. So worst case scenario is, so, okay. So that puts a lot of people out of business. Correct. I'm, I'll, I'm out. Yeah. Yep. For now. I mean, they, yeah. they were looking mm-hmm. for feedback. Now there's a couple of different ways to go here. One is they actually look at the feedback and go, hey, you know what? This cuts out, you know, 90% or whatever. And, and the negative is not only the number of instructors that are cut out, going to be put out of business. What you think supply and demand, what is that going to do? As right. far as the availability of classes for the general public that are looking to still get their CCWs. It'll bottleneck CCWs. Yep. It'll shut the whole thing down. And it's going to raise that rate right. exorbitantly. But there's there's a couple different avenues here, and let me just run through them real quick. One is 
they just wanted feedback. This isn't the they, this isn't the decree. This isn't the this is how it is, and there's nothing else you can do about it. Mm-hmm. So there is a possibility, and there is a history of them taking advice and going, okay, yeah, we see that you know we've we've created a, the you know a, a situation where we've given somebody you know two weeks, and, and then boom, they're completely out of business. So there is a possibility they might say, hey, you know what, you get twelve months to figure this out or whatever. There might they might add they might say hey you know what we're going to add these other certifications back because they make sense um, you know that is a distinct possibility mm-hmm. now I know that you know it's easy to sit back and go oh California's never going to do anything right and whatever blah 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 this is a distinct possibility this could absolutely happen there are enough people who said hey who made a reasonable case that hey that you you, you know you have to include these other certifications or you have to do, produce some kind of avenue uh, for me to be able to be an instructor. Um, the other thing is I spent the weekend talking to attorneys. So, uh, we have an attorney, he's building a case. Um, uh, you know, he's looking at, at, at filing the case. If when their, their final instructions come out, you know, there will be a lawsuit against it. Um, different attorney than the attorneys I'm, I'm working with on the SB2 sensitive areas case. And they basically said, Hey, you know what, we'll, we'll assist with this other one, but it's probably better you know, to go with this other one. We have plaintiffs. The, we have an attorney. We're looking for funding. We we obviously have a case. So these things, uh, it looks like things are going to move forward. But I do think that it is a we've made a reasonable case that hey, you're putting a bunch of people out of business. Mm-hmm. You know this this is uh, you know um, there's no path for some people to be able to do what they were doing for a living. Um, so uh, you know. I think that there is a very distinct possibility that they're going to come out and say, here are the final regs, and boom, there is a path for, for people like Alicia, like others in the county. Like I, I think it's like 87 other people in the county right, yeah. out of the 90 uh, to be able to teach CCWs. So everyone, take a breath. <laughs> you know, I know it's, a, it's bad news. It's not great. It's SB2 related. We've been talking about how horrible SB2 is. We're continuing to fight it. But, you know, there, we got to follow the path. What doesn't help is panicking, hand wringing, you know, uh, conspiracy theories. What helps is funding the organizations that are going to pay for this lawsuit. Um, you know, submitting the feedback. If you did that last week, thank you very much. I, th- I think there's a very distinct possibility that, that you did some good and you're going to make some changes. Um, not spreading false information and getting involved, making sure that you're doing something. If this really angers you, you know, if this really makes you upset, then it's time to get involved because complaining about it without action is just whining and we don't like whiners. So that's the update on SB2. We're definitely going to continue to talk more about it. When we get back, I'm going to uh, read a press release from Not Me, California, and then that's going to lead into Desi, the illustrious leader in the Not Me SD program here in San Diego. Hey, Not Me for Women by Women is a design to help women with training purchase a gun, getting concealed carry permit, and guess what? It's free. And if you are a woman or you know a woman who needs help, have her sign up and we will give her the help she needs. Go to, if we need you to sign up, just go to notmesd.org or if you see me on the street, I got business cards. Yes, you do. Not Me SD is a program uh, that was uh, designed for women uh, to stop uh, sexual assault and domestic violence by making sure that all women who contact us have the ability to purchase a gun or are taught how to do it, um, have training so that they can be successful and safe with a firearm, and then a, uh, a permit. So basically, if you're a woman, you contact us, we, we put you in touch with a trained volunteer who's an ambassador, and she helps her through the process of purchasing a gun getting training, and getting a permit. And if any of that is cost prohibitive, then we find a grant or a discount or whatever we got to do to make sure that her self-defense is not cost prohibitive. So we opened up a 501c3, which is a charity, means that donations are tax deductible, um, to support the program. And the name of the charity, the name of the 501c3 is Not Me California. So the name of the program, the people that actually do the stuff, is Not Me San Diego, and then the name of the 501c3 that that helps provide funding is Not Me California. And it is a 501c3 right here in California, and they just issued, it's been around, I don't think it's been around for a full year yet, but they just issued um, their first uh, uh, press release. I thought it was interesting. 
And I'm going to read it. Not Me California speaks out to condemn the brutal sexual assault against women in Israel. San Diego, California, Not Me California is a 501c3 organization dedicated to women's empowerment and self-defense. We would be remiss if we didn't speak out to condemn the brutal sexual assault of so many women and young girls by the terrorist group Hamas in Israel on October 7th, 2023. Unfortunately, we are finding that among women's groups, our voice of condemnation is almost completely alone. We refuse to be an organization so concerned about the broad political issues surrounding the situation that we choose to remain silent about such heinous, horrible acts of violence against women. It is important to emphasize that this violence was, uh, excuse me, it is important to emphasize that this was violence against women because they were women, and that is completely unacceptable. We stand in solidarity with all women who have been victimized simply because of their gender, and we encourage all to join us on the right side of history. Not Me asks everyone to condemn the horrific attacks against women by terrorists and pressure other groups into making a statement of condemnation, especially groups whose purpose is to support women. We also ask you all to actively oppose policies that make self-defense more difficult for women and support organizations that empower women. We also ask that no matter what differences we all have in other public policy issues, we all put them aside and stand firm when it comes to the issue of women's safety. And then it talks about how Not Me California 501c3 is designed to help sexual assault and domestic violence uh, or against uh, sexual assault and domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, to summarize, this press release says, look, whatever political issues are surrounding uh, you know, the conflict in October in Israel and Gaza, um, there were women who were violently and horrifically attacked and sexually assaulted. And uh, you know, there weren't reports of men being sexually assaulted. This was uh, an act of violence against women because they were women. Um, and that's horrific and completely unacceptable. And because of the political concerns surrounding what was going on uh, that day with those two, you know, Israel and, and, and Gaza, there were too many people that were afraid to speak out against what happened to the women. And we thought that was horrible. We thought that was horrific. We thought that that was uh, uh, unnecessarily um, uh, cowardice. So Not Me California's first public statement First press release was condemning sexual assault and, and the brutality uh, that happened that day against women. And I applaud it. I thought it was a good statement. I thought it was a brave statement and a, and a, and a good start. But the real purpose of that organization is to provide funding so that women in the Not Me SD program um, can afford training, can afford firearms, can afford self-defense, can afford their permit, uh, and make sure that Desi has a resource to help women. Right. And we do have resources to help women because, Mike, to your point, the sad reality is that one in three women will be a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault at some point in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And what's going on in Israel just really kind of nails that point because you hear about all of these, you know, horrible things that are happening to women, but they happen here all the time. Yeah, it's, I not, mean, it's not just out in the Middle East. No, it's, it's not just right here in San Diego County. Exactly. And so with one in three women, I mean, think about how many girls we had at our ambassador party last night. How many girls did you have? We had about nine, right? Nice. So that means that three of them, if you look at statistics, would be a victim at some point in their lifetime. God, God forbid. Right. But hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully but. that's not the case. I mean, all the women, of course, last night were all gun owners. And so we'd hope that we've done everything we can to protect ourselves. So if something does happen then we know what to do, right? But Well, I thought the way Masada Ayub earlier in the show put it, where he talked about how it was a tool, you know, yep. mm -hmm. a, a preventative measure. Um, I, I don't know how someone could argue that an armed woman, someone who has a firearm, a woman who has a firearm, is harder to assault. I, I just don't know how you can argue that point. Harder to assault. Yeah. I hope you if, wouldn't assault them I mean, if they had a firearm. Well, that's what, so I'm giving <laughs> right? even, even I'm even being I'm even throwing the softball saying it makes it harder. I think it makes it impossible. I would think it's impossible because if someone came at me and I was holding a firearm to protect myself, I would hope that would defer them from doing that. Yeah, somebody once told me that uh, and I thought this was so well put that a gun really isn't a sword, it's a shield. Kind of. Which I always kind of liked that. Well, think about in a situation like myself, right? Think mm -hmm. about if I'm a gun owner, it's an equalizer. Because a lot of times if a man is going to try to come and assault me, they're going to be bigger than I am, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. a pretty tall female. Yep. So for someone to try to attack me, that's very ballsy of them to do, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going to try to over, you know, overpower me with their strength. 
I'm pretty strong, but I'm not stronger than a lot of men out there. So how long have you been heading up this program now? Been about three and a half years. In three and a half years. Now, are you, I, one of the things that has really shocked me and surprised me, uh, you know, being involved with this program and, and, you know, uh, putting it out there for folks is, um, I didn't realize how common the problem was. You know, have the numbers surprised you? Is there a particular stat or number that's really, you thought, oh my God, I had no idea. Or as a woman, is this, you know, and having a lot of friends that were women and having a lot of tough conversations, was this something that didn't surprise you? So I have always been a very dominant female, as you know. And so I have always, you know, hung out with strong females. And so by being involved with this program for the past three and a half years, I didn't realize how many women out there have been victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. And they were my friends that I just never knew about, right? Mm. So you're le I've learned a lot more. And this is what I'll always tell people. Everybody has a story. And they're not always sunshine and rainbows. Mm. And so what I'm seeing a lot by being involved with this program for so many years is that there have been so many women that have been victims of domestic violence and sexual assault that have, one, been my friends, and two, have actually come through the program that – they saw us on KUSI, right? Or they heard me on the radio or they see me out and about. And they're like, hey, like I saw you. This is my story. Like, how can you help me? Alicia, the, the frequency that we're seeing or, the, you know, the statistics we've put out, uh, basically same question to you. Did, mm -hmm. did Does this surprise you when, you when you've seen these or did this confirm what you already knew? And Alicia's an ambassador, just so you know, too. She is one of our volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. I, unfortunately, it did not surprise me a whole lot. Mm. Um, you know, growing up, you know, being female, right? You know, I, I know you're a guy, so, you know, obviously these conversations happen different for you. But even through high school, you know, many, you know, just, just a you know, few years ago, you know, friends and people even in that environment that young where it was actually pretty, unfortunately, not all that uncommon even then. And so that, you know, just through the years, friends, people you come across, you know, women talk. You know, guys, you know, guys don't inter have an interaction with women. So I think men don't have that same perception or that same understanding. But, you know, girls talk. We talk and we share. And so it really, yeah. I don't set it on the, it, it, it's, it, it, men and women live in a completely different world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's the same planet, Mars and Venus, no. <laughs> but it might as well be complete. <laughs> I just, it's, it's, um, it is very literally, um, unfathomable to me mm -hmm. that, you know, men are attacking women. You know, but, or, or I just, it, I can't fathom that. It well, doesn't make sense to me. 93% of sexual assault victims are women though. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, What's men... the percentage of the men that actually know their victim? So eight out of 10 women knew the person who actually sexually assaulted her. See, that's the part so, that gets me. Yeah. You're seeing a lot of these situations happening in relationships, especially a lot of domestic violence victims came out of COVID because mm. women were too scared to get out and they didn't know what was going to happen. Mm. You know, a lot of companies waste an enormous amount of money on marketing. The design is excellent. The photos are beautiful. And your website looks great, but it's just not getting customers. Why? Why? I don't know. Why? Maybe because you just don't have the words. Oh, well, that makes that will make people buy. But you know what? We know somebody that can fix that. Sage Tree. They can help you find the words that make it easy for your customer to understand what you do and how to buy from you. Stop wasting money today and schedule a call. Getting started is easy. Visit sagetree.com. Click on the schedule an appointment button. That's sagetree.com and click on the schedule a call button now. So we're talking to Desi from Not Me SD, and uh, we've talked a lot about the program. Um, first off, where do where do they go? What's the website? NotMeSD.org. NotMeSD.org. If you are a woman or know a woman um, who uh, either what, what, what why would they contact? They'd contact us if they wanted help purchasing a firearm, yep. finding a qualified instructor, yep. or applying for your CCW. Or if any of that is cost prohibitive, um, we they have help. a 501c3 that will help them. We Correct. never want cost to be a reason that you can't get the help that you need to protect yourself. Right. Or if they have a gun, it was given as a gift and they've never, ever used it. Or if your husband or boyfriend or girlfriend have a gun and you want to learn how to use it, you know, we're here. So what we've seen is a big increase in women, not just victims of domestic violence or sexual assault, coming to us because they don't know where else to go. Mm -hmm. If you think about when you walk into a gun shop, nine out of 10 people behind the counter are men. Dudes. They're dudes. And the way a dude talks to somebody about a gun is going to be completely different than say I would talk to Alicia about a firearm. So mm -hmm. we've learned that women just really want someone to hold their hand. And it's almost like a concierge service, right? Where we're going to 
walk you through the process from start to finish on how to find a gun, how to find a qualified instructor, and then I do virtual seminars on how to apply for your CCW. But let's recap, Mike, and go back to gun prom and the big milestone that we hit right before gun prom. All right. right? How many? So, so that's where you go and what you get if you contact us. Right. So the milestone is how many people have now contacted us and, and, and we've helped. And we've helped. So we've helped them get a firearm. We've helped them find its instructors. Yeah. And we possibly helped them apply for their CCW. So, or some, some variant of some that. Variant some variant of whatever that, Whatever right? they needed, we provided. Correct. More, more than seven? Just a few more than okay, seven. So – Back at gun prom, we'd hit the biggest milestone that not me had hit, which was a thousand graduates. All right, thousand, and now the new milestone is drum roll, please. Uh, okay, Mr. no Ray. drum roll. <laughs> no, no drum roll. Apparently, I'm I'm uh, over he's, here. He's, the new he's milestone. Slacking. The new milestone is 1,100 oh, graduates. Oh, congratulations! So that means that since gun prom, which that was back in September, uh-huh. we've helped a hundred women through the program. Wow. Now that's, that's a pretty big number for such a short time period because that's almost 30 a month that we're actually helping through the program. I was gonna say, man. Okay, so three. Okay, so see, three years, right? So three times 12. What's 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 three times? 36. 36. 36. Yeah, add another. So that's 42. So let's take 1,100 and let's divide by 42. By the way, doing math, good radio. It's good radio. Trust me on that. So just just since you've been there, Desi. You already lost Dave. He doesn't have that many toes. Yeah, he doesn't. He, <laughs> he, 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 he always lost. Was. Anytime math's involved, he's out of the room. Bye. Um, unless it's number of laps a race car does. Okay, so that's 26 a month. Not a bad number. That's like one. That's 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 over one per business day a month for three and a half years. Mm-hmm. Congratulations, Desi. That's a lot of hard work. Um, hey, that's you? all you. I mean, that's truly all you. You know, we set this up more than three and a half years ago, right? And boom, it just hit a. a it was we were it hit a bottleneck and we ground to a halt. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. we launched this whole program. I mean, it, you know, San Diego County Gunner is a political organization. Right. And this 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 was kind of a, you know, a it side It was an project. idea. Yeah. And an Whose idea was it? It was, it, was, it was just an idea, Dave. You don't know who did it? I, it was my idea. I read you an could, article. You, and, you could take a little credit. Yeah. I read an article and came up with the idea. But uh, the implementation was raw <laughs> and horrible for like the first year. Until you got hurt of control. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, we were just inundated. You know, we thought, hey, this would be a neat idea. And then boom, a lot of people thought it was a neat idea. So, and then boom, you needed me. We needed Desi. We hired Desi. And man, what a blessing. I mean, the amount of work that you put in, uh, the value that those women get is uh, is just amazing. And I congratulate you. You did a fantastic job. You continue to do a fantastic job. The, I, I think, you know, one of the most important things, when you have somebody working on a project, um, you know, what's the most important thing when it comes to success? I mean, you could say money. You could say whatever. You could say knowledge. You could say track record. I think it's passion. I think, and, and Desi has an enormous amount of passion. I think that I could find someone and, uh, you know, pay them twice as much. I could find someone that has 10 times the experience, whatever that looks like. Um, but if they don't have the passion that you do, I, I, they're not going to do anywhere near a good as job. And, and you've done such a good job. And you are so qualified and the program runs so well because of you. And I thank you so much. Well, and, I, and thank you, Mike. I appreciate the kind words. What I love about the program is that mm-hmm. we continue to evolve, right? So whenever it's – our focus is always firearms, right? And so what we do is we, of course, start with shooting socials. That's a great introduction to, you know, firearms. And I would say we do a Not Me shooting social, you know, every other month. Mm-hmm. But even at our general shooting socials, 8 out of 10 are women, mm-hmm. right? So women are seeing the value in learning how to shoot. And if you look at also the statistics – Women are the biggest increase of firearm sales in the past couple of years, right? Ever since COVID, yep. women are understanding that they need to protect themselves. And what you'll also notice, too, is that with the rise in crime, right? Women have to defend ourselves because we were talking with um, – who was our guy that we were talking with earlier? Masada. 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 You know, police Somewhere response there. times are at an all-time high right now. And so you can't, um, you can't count on the police to protect them. And it's not – Slowing and they're down. not slowing down, correct? Like if priority one call right now in San Diego County, the last time I checked was 40 minutes. Or if you're being- That's a, too many minutes. Too many minutes. A lot can happen well, in five minutes. That's about 39 and a half. Right. <laughs> too long. Well, like, too long. Like too long. John Korea says when seconds matter, police are minutes away. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not their fault. That, no. That's just the, that's the reality of it. So you said something interesting. And I don't want to skip over it. The um, one thing I've been really happy about is our shooting socials. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like you said, like eight out of 10 are just the regular, not the not mm-hmm. me ones, Correct. but just the regular ones are women. Yep. Mm-hmm. I, when we first started this, that was not the case. 
And, and before San Diego County Gun Owners, when I was helping with with other educational shoots, not the case. Right. You know, it was mostly men. And whatever's changed, changed for the better. I can't even tell. When I do, last time I went to a shooting social, I remember asking, so you run our shooting social, do mm-hmm. a great job. I remember asking you, like, is this the not me one or not the not? Because they're all women. They're all I women. I couldn't even tell. Yeah. And a lot of people think that the shooting socials are just a not me creation. No. They don't. Those shooting socials predate not me. And that's not the only thing. No. Not me is a whole different, whole different program. Correct. But you can't even tell now. It just looks like it's a women's program because there's so many women learning how to shoot. But women love to learn. And if you talk to any of the mentors, they'll say, I love to teach women. You know why? It's because women listen. (laughs) And so they would rather teach a female student over a male student because we actually listen to the instruction. They do listen. We got to think of a better way because I've been saying that for a while too. Mm -hmm. Men men truly, they don't listen. They just think, "Ah, I'm a... I got testosterone. I can shoot. Right. That's, that's not, not the case. Yeah, believe it or not, that's not how you learn how to shoot is right. more testosterone. But it's it's more than just they listen. They, I don't know, they like. I think well, they have a healthy respect. And so right. they, not only do they listen, but they're very careful to implement it the proper way. They, and they react. They right. say, okay, uh, I want to understand this. Mm-hmm. And then I want to take that understanding and implement it. Right. Where men don't have, they don't have, we don't have that kind of time. Right. <laughs> right. We got to, you know, okay. it's this, I think it's, the, it's honestly, I think it's the same reason we don't ask for directions. That's it. You know, we That's just it. like, ah, we'll figure it out. So one thing I will say too is so recently we did a Not Me SD, actually Krav Maga women's class with one of the instructors that I work very closely with. Mm-hmm. And I got some feedback from the instructor and him, they loved working with our Not Me girls. And you want to know why, Mike? <laughs> Because he said they were right. not afraid to fight for their lives. Yeah. And he said it's a very different mindset than, say, someone coming in off the street just, you know, wanting to learn. But these women already have that flight or fight mentality because they've been learning firearms and they've been going through the Not Me SD program. And so to put them in a women's self-defense class, he said these women were there to fight. And well, they were there to learn and they were there to protect themselves. Dave, you asked whose idea it was. When I did think of this, I read an article. They kind of blamed gun ownership on, you know, on, uh, on uh, domestic violence and, and sexual assault and I thought of this idea I said all right that's it we're gonna have a program where you know if you're a woman you want a gun we're gonna get you a gun we're gonna get you a permit and boom 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 like a no nonsense like just get this thing done and I started talking to men about it and they all said no that's no that's not a good idea the optics it's too aggressive whatever and then I talked to women about it and they were they're not afraid to fight just like oh. you said. They're like, hell yeah, somebody touches me, I want to be able to defend myself. Right. So I stopped talking to dudes about it. I only talked to women. I was like, hey, we're just going to talk to women about this. And, you know, the women, uh, uh, you know, built it out and, uh, you know, cleared came up the with that. Well, they cleared the path. They came up with the details, you know, and well, they knew uh, what they watched wanted. it. And now Desi, a woman, runs it and successful and, and uh, fantastic instructors and, and qualified uh, uh, passionate and the, volunteers like Alicia. And the percentage of your ambassadors that come back I is what I think is impressive. It's, mm-hmm. it's great when people come through the program and they say, I had such a great experience, I want to give back now. Right. And when they do that, that means, of course, we've given them all the resources they need to be successful. And they're confident enough in their firearms knowledge that now they want to give back to the program. And I, I love when that happens. And I know we've only got a couple minutes left. And I always love to tell success stories about women that have come through the the program, right? So fire away. Everybody else has gone over. I mean, I'm not going to go over, but no, go ahead. Yeah. So I love, I mean, it's unfortunate when women come to us because they have been a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. So when these cases come through, I of course will always, you know, handhold them because they take a very unique touch and they carry, they take a special touch to actually work with these women. And so the most recent woman that came to us, she had been a victim of domestic violence and this all happened during COVID. Hmm. And it was the perfect example of she couldn't get out because no one knew what was going to happen in the world, right? COVID shut everything down. And so she had to stay in this situation because- Well, government did. Yeah, the government did. Well, but she had to stay in this situation because she had no way out. Mm -hmm. And so once she finally could get out, you know, she was badly bruised. She had broken bones and everything from this, right? And so she was trying to make her way on her own. And when you are a victim of domestic violence, you go through a lot of different types of trauma. And one of them is a mental trauma where you're always scared that when you see that person on the street or when you see them somewhere, that they're going to attack you or do something to you again. And so she unfortunately was in a situation where she couldn't afford a firearm. But she saw me on KUSI, you know, a few months ago and she reached out to the program 
And, you know, when I finally started talking with her and hearing her story, you know, it, it always hurts my heart when I hear these stories because I never want to hear women when they have been in these situations, but they come to us for a reason. And this is where I get to come in and help them. And so she reached out and we helped her apply for her CCW. Mike and I work with the sheriff's department and we got her appointment from, you know, a year later to pushed up to a month later. She's already gone to her first appointment for her CCW. We helped her get a firearm and she's been doing training. You know, she's been learning a lot with it. And now she's in a situation where she'll have her CCW in the next 60 days. And she feels empowered that she can protect herself. And I've never felt so much gratitude from someone before because when we can give them this help and when we can help them take their safety back into their own hands, that's a feeling that you can never take away and will stay with these women for the rest of their lives. There you go. One way to support uh, this program is to support the organization that helps fund it. So go to notmeca.org and you can make a tax deductible donation uh, to help make sure that Desi has the resources to be successful and even more successful than she's already been. So go to notmeca.org, make a donation. Hey, if you're a gun owner and if you ever need to use your gun to protect yourself or your loved ones, you need legal protection. Even if you do everything right, even if you're 100% justified, you should be prepared for the legal battle after your self-defense battle. We've seen it right here in San Diego where an innocent man showed his firearm to discourage a violent attacker, and he had to spend thousands of dollars in legal fees to restore his freedom and rights. That's why you need firearms legal protection. When you join, you get uncapped legal protection for self-defense, for civil or criminal cases with a 24-7 hotline. Joining is real easy. Just go to firearmslegal.com, click on Become a Member, Use code GOR for a discount. Enjoy the peace of mind knowing that you're protected. And if you ever are involved in a self-defense incident, remember it's firearmslegal.com and use the discount code GOR. And did you see all the stuff they sent us? No. Who? FLP? Yeah. They sent us a bunch of stuff? Boxes and boxes. And that's what I had to I didn't get any un- stuff. Well, Rich got it all. That's why. That's that's why we call him Rich. Yeah, you, you, got got banners, all stuff. you got banners, you got hats, you got all kinds of stuff. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you, FLP, for that. And uh, yeah, we got to get that guy on the air. The uh, the guy, the the Who's person the that you're talking about. Who's the producer? Uh, well, Rich is, but we'll we'll get him on the air. The guy that uh, showed his firearm and discouraged a violent oh, attacker. We got to get that guy and interview him because uh, mm-hmm. I think that'd be very very interesting. We he helped change policy. I don't know if you know that or not, but that uh, situation. Uh, Help change the policy in San Diego. The district attorney now sends uh, defensive gun use when a CCW holder is involved through a special operations unit. And they investigate it so that uh, they're not looked at as, you know, they're not investigated by the same people who investigate, you know, a gang member or something like that. There's mm-hmm. somebody, you know, they, they have a CCW, so they're investigated in a in a different way. I don't It's not preferential. It's just different treatment because it's a different situation. Okay. So we should we should interview him is what I'm what I'm trying to say. Okay, everybody's favorite um, segment, Sam the Gunman, my nephew. Uh, we found out years ago that he's really good at gun trivia. So we now have a segment called Stump My Nephew. If you send in a question that has to do with firearms and we use it on the air, we'll give you a, a, a shirt or a hat or, or something cool like that. If you stump my nephew, then we'll give you a special a special prize, which might be it might be gun show related, it might be gun prom related. We'll see. We got all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, Desi is going to, who, who's going to read it? Me. Alicia's going to read it. it. Okay. Sam, you there? Yeah. How are you guys? Good, man. Are you ready? Hope so. Okay. <laughs> and and you, has anyone prepared you for today's question in any way? Uh, nope. No. It's the first time you'll ever hear it. All right. Fire All right. away. All right. Sam, you ready? All right. So, your, question, so. All right, your question comes from Tyler, and Tyler's from San Bernardino. And the question is, what did Frenchman Clement Patet, perf- and I might be saying that wrong, a uh, perfect in 1855. Um, read, what was the year again? Read it, read it one more time, the whole question. What did Frenchman Clement Patet perfect in 1855? 1855? 1855. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tyler from San Bernardino, for writing in. Um, I'm pretty sure San Bernardino is a real place. It is. Um, <laughs> Fairly, uh, fairly real. Oh, it, it's it gets you, it gets very real in San Bernardino. So yes. 
All right. Um, what did he perfect in, in 1855? Oh, and uh, to, to listeners from San Bernardino, I hope I didn't offend you. That was not my intent. Um, I, I believe my uncle that San Bernardino is definitely a real place that is not made up. I'm going to forward um, you all the hate email from the San Bernadus <laughs> that email me. <laughs> well, that means they're listening, so I'll take it. Um, what did he perfect in 1855? Um, I, I'm pretty sure this is going to be wrong. First of all, that's a really good question, Tyler. Thank you. I'm pretty sure this is going to be wrong, but I want to say it was. Um, mm. Hmm. Hmm. Did I, we actually mm, stump him? We'll see. No, Ooh. no, I no. I want to say it dun, was dun, the dun. Minier ball, but that was named after the guy who invented it. Mm. So now, my, now I'm second guessing myself and thinking. Um, something having to do with, with uh, like a crank-operated repeating weapon. But I'm going to go with my first guess. Um, it had something to do with the Minier ball. What is First off, what is the Minier ball? Yeah, we don't even know. Um, pointy bullet with a hollow cavity in the base. Okay. You're, you're in the right ballpark. You're in the, you're in the, you're, you're, literally not, the right ballpark. Correct, but you're, was it the cleaner bullet? Are we talking about the cleaner bullet? No. What is the cleaner bullet? <laughs> um, it's complicated. Oh. All right. Well, no, not what, that. you want to read the yeah, final answer? Should, should we have her read Tyler's answer? Yeah, and then he can go tell us whether or not it's I right think, or not. I think you stumped me. <laughs> I think it. you got me. Okay, go so, for it. All right. So here it is. So first invented in 1829, Clement Pate, which, I, by the way, I never took French, so I'm sure I'm saying that very wrong. 1829. You got it. No, you said it totally right. Clement, no. P O T T E T. So Invented is not a French word. Neither is the, the no. inventor was French. So Clement Pate, Pate perfected his design for center fire ammunition in 1855. Ah. Center fire cartridges replaced rim fire cartridges as the most popular form of cartridges because of their increased reliability, durability, and safety. Further, the stronger base of a center fire cartridge can withstand higher pressures, which gives bullets more energy and velocity. So the fact that he had the the, the minute ball, he mm -hmm. was like it, yeah. ammunition. He was in the right yeah. right ballpark. ballpark. Like so, yeah. And he had, and he, yeah, exactly. It upsets me to no end that a Frenchman invented bullets, basically <laughs> bullet, <laughs> well, cartridges the, that the, we the use today. Design, the primary design. Yeah, they also the invented smokeless powder, so you have them to thank for that as well. You know, now I, I I actually looked a little bit further into this. They are more reliable, and of course, the durability and safety that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. But you know why a Frenchman had to invent cartridges that were more durable and and, and safer? Mm -hmm. Because they kept dropping them and running the other way, so they had to have cartridges <laughs> that were far more durable. Okay, before before you finish with that thought, <laughs> what country? Yeah. What country's military has won more battles than any other? What country's military has won more battles? Let me just hang on a second. What country's military has won more battles? Not necessarily more wars, but more battles than any other. Is that that's the question, right? Win, winningest, winningest military. Go. Win, winningest military. So battles, not war, battles. I, I, you know, because we're talking, because I just trashed the French. I'm going to assume is it the French? Yeah, it's French. It's the French, but. Every country out there has some kind of celebration, you know, some kind of national uh, celebration for beating the French. I mean, even Mexico has a day that they celebrate nationally when they beat up on the French. And I, I fully that's, support that. Well, that's not completely true. Um, more countries that have Independence Days celebrate their independence from the British Empire than any other colonial power. Well, that's a fact, too. That's a fact. And the French did help us beat up on the Brits. All right, fine. This is true. French, Frenchman. Local to me at Yorktown. Well, not local, local. It's like it's five, six hours away, but it's close. It's all in good fun. And to be honest with you, the uh, just the very concept of, of uh, the American experiment, the uh, – the you know the the country of the self governed um, where you know the, the government uh, protects your rights and you get to determine your own future, you know that very concept was uh, um, a very French concept. So maybe I should stop b bashing the French. They uh, they they were a um, they transitioned to or they tried to transition to democracy around the same time we did. Uh, they had some troubles with that, but um, they're they're trying to figure it out. They're working on it. Aren't we all? At the end of the day, Sam, aren't we all just trying to figure it out, man? 
Well, um, uh, if you'll indulge me, or if you'll allow me to indulge in a little bit of American exceptionalism, Please do. Uh, they're on their fifth republic right now, um, <laughs> and we've been using the Constitution since 1789. So <laughs> hey. I think we've been a little bit more successful. Yeah, how do you how do you bring me around to be on the French's side and then poke at them like that at the end? <laughs> I feel a little uh-huh. duped. I feel a little duped. Uh, good points all. I know you're, uh, you're, uh, you're at the end of your semester, so you, you haven't been pumping out the, uh, the articles as of late, but you're going to pick that up in a couple of weeks. So, uh, I don't think you have an article yes. to promote, do you? Um, not yet. Blog posts resume soon now that I have more time. Well, fantastic job. Um, we stumped you this time, so I owe Tyler something special. So Tyler, let's you and I talk and we'll figure out, we'll get you your hat or your shirt and then we'll figure out what special award uh, you're going to win for stumping my nephew. So fantastic they job, a, Tyler. They have a Denny's in San Bernardino. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, you know, where that's uh, that's where the, the first cracker McDonald's. Barrel. That's true. Do they have a Cracker Barrel? Well, they so. do what? up by uh, off the uh, 15. Yeah. Well, that might be worth the drive. <laughs> I maybe it might be Cracker Barrel. It might be a little bit more special than Cracker Barrel. We'll see. So. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. Excellent job. Thank you for uh, uh, for for doing so well every week on the show like this. This is an awesome, awesome thing. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. And uh, Tyler, well done. You got me good. Oh. All right. Very good. Thank you very much, bud. You're the best. Can you believe that guy? Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Just uh, even when he misses, he's close. Yeah, but he got me on board with the French, and then slapped you. And then <laughs> and he did good. Like like one of those like he took like his dueling glove off and it slapped smacked. him like a Frenchman. Oh, now you got to duel. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode from Gun Owners Radio. If you're watching mainstream media, you're not getting the truth about guns and the Second Amendment. Gun Owners Radio is the easiest way to stay on top of the Second Amendment fight, the fight for your self-defense rights. You can watch our live stream on YouTube every Sunday from four to six p.m. California time, or if you're in San Diego, AM eleven seventy FM ninety six one The Answer. We're also available on your favorite podcast platform. Just do a search for Gun Owners Radio and you'll find our show. Don't forget to support our sponsors. Click on the links in the show notes and support the businesses that support your Second Amendment rights. Like and subscribe to help defend and restore the Second Amendment, not just in California, but across the country.